morning and welcome to the three minute thesis here at Arkansas State University. This is our second year of competition and we welcome nine competitors today. They will be challenged with presenting what will appear to be very complex information that they've been working on for years in a very brief and understandable uh, format. And so this three minute thesis, it actually comes to us from the University of Queensland. That's all the way over in Australia. And in the past few years, it has gained um, international recognition. And now we have competitors all around the world. This is the first heat and the top competitors from this heat will then advance to the finals at one o'clock this afternoon. The number one person, the overall winner, will then compete in a regional competition to be hosted in New Orleans, Louisiana in February 2015. We welcome our panel of judges today. So we have a very esteemed um, panel here. And um, if you don't mind, because you have your backs turned, if you would each please stand up and turn and face the audience and tell them who you are and your affiliation. Good morning. I'm Jill Simons. I'm Dean of University College, and I'm glad to be here this morning. Good morning. I'm also Mia Yi. I'm Chair of the Department of Media. I'm glad to be here as well. Judges. Hi, <laughs> I'm Bill Smith. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at A State. Good morning. I'm Mike Doyle. I'm the station manager of KASU, your NPR radio station here on campus. And also seated with the judges, but not a judge, um, Dr. Eric Gilbert. And he and I help to host uh, the three minute thesis each year. So we will get started in just a minute. Um, but I would like to remind everyone who is here to please silence uh, any electronic devices that you have. So cell phones, um, iPods, iPads, whatever you have, please either turn them off or put them on silent so that we do not have any interruptions during the presentation. <coughs> Another important uh, announcement is that the audience today, you all will be voting at the end of the nine presentations. You all will be selecting what we call the People's Choice Award. It will be determined during this meet. So, at the end, we hope that you will stay throughout the, the uh, presentations. Again, they're each just three minutes in length. If a presenter goes over time, they will be stopped. Okay? They are not allowed to continue beyond the three minutes. If you're just coming in, there are programs in the back if you want to pick up a copy, and they will tell you the order of presentations. Okay, so a couple of other things um, on the history. This was the official welcome, by the way, by me. And then I've actually already gone over uh, several uh, of the items that are pointed out on this slide. We've been introduced to the heat. Um, judging panel, and these are some of the rules. So the presenters today, they are allowed a single slide. This slide cannot have any animations, it cannot have any audio, uh, etc. And they cannot use any other props uh, during their presentation. Again, they have to speak what they're going to say. They cannot sing it, they can't rap it, you know, can't dance it out, any of that, <laughs> mine is. Uh, and um, the judges, again, will have a scoring rubric, and they are graded on uh, these criteria, their communication style, uh, comprehension, and engagement. So those will be the three categories that the judges will score, and I believe each is out of 10 points. Is that correct? There is money to be had today. Uh, People's Choice Award uh, will be $100. <coughs> Third place, $150. Second place, $250. And the first place winner, again, $500 and an all expenses paid trip to the regional competition. It is possible that uh, one person could win it 
won of the uh, overall second or third place prizes as well as the People's Choice. So it is possible that one person who competes could walk away with two awards. First up, we have Elizabeth Castillo, and she represents environmental sciences. And her presentation is called The Link Between Foliar Vitamin C Content and Cold Tolerance in Rice. So Elizabeth, if you will please um, take your place. And Dr. Gilbert, once the um, timer starts, that is when um, you can begin. Repayment 
within the first three years of graduating. Why is this important? Another great question. This current research seeks to understand how students perceive a college degree. With that understanding, we can overcome such risks as the 66% becoming delinquent on their loans, especially when the New York Bank Reserve is saying that we are approaching a $902 billion threshold of student loan debt. That's quite a bit. Okay, so now what? Another great question. This research aims to have a better understanding of how we perceive a college degree so that we can overcome the risks that are involved in seeking that degree. Because that the statistics provided earlier was with college graduates. What about those who drop out or don't finish? Those have even higher delinquency rates and have even harder problems trying to repay those loans, obviously. The aim of this study is not to disturb, to deter students away from an enrolling in college and seeking a degree. It is instead to create awareness and hopefully prompt them to find ways to safeguard against uh, the risks that are involved. How? Start at the finish line. Think like an investor. Like an investor, you research the market. As a college goer, you are a stakeholder and you are investing in your future. You need to research the job market. It changes just as the investment market does. Research the market. Talk to advisors. Talk to people within that profession. Talk to teachers and make a game plan. Outline your college degree plan based on what's at the finish line. Lastly, I say to you again, this is not to deter students away from attending college, but instead find a better way to overcome such risks. Only when we learn how students perceive college can we learn how to overcome certain risks involved in seeking that degree. Thank you. Our third presenter is Dawn Bessie from Educational Leadership and her presentation is the impact of intervention practices on the academic self-concept of struggling middle school students. or interventions in order to increase their skills and knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, those students may receive intervention services in a separate, segregated learning environment where they are pulled from their mixed ability students, peers, and receive those interventions uh, in a separate class, a separate class period, before school or after school. Some students receive interventions in that segregated environment in addition to an integrated environment where they are also receiving additional instructional uh, support in their regular classroom with mixed ability students. And then some students who are not meeting grade level proficiencies are not receiving intervention services at all. What I wanted to do in my study is look at these group of struggling learners and compare their academic self-concepts in regards to the type of interventions that they received, segregated, a, com a combination of segregated and integrated, and whether or not they received any intervention services at all. What my data showed from all of the students that I surveyed was that on a scale of one to eight uh, with their academic self-concept, that students who were in segregated interventions had a lower self-concept in the subjects than the students who received segregated and integrated or combined intervention services. And both of those groups who were receiving segregated uh, or combined interventions 
had lower self-concepts than students who received no interventions at all. The differences were significant for math, uh, but not literacy, but you can still see the same patterns, that the more a student is segregated from their mixed ability peers, the lower their self-perception of themselves in that academic subject. It is my hope that educators can take this information and uh, have that in the back of their minds when they are planning the intervention services so that they can capitalize on increasing student achievement while keeping their academic self-concept uh, in, in consideration as well. Thank you. Presenter number four, Nazmul Chaudhry from Engineering. Presentation title, Interstate Systems and Safety. Not more. When you uh, park your car in the parking of our university campus, then, then you might have seen the cracks. Even when you drive in the, in, in the, in the, in the English State 40 west of the Conway, then you will see the poor condition of, poor condition of, of the roads. Each year, the government of United States spends more than $200 billion for the maintenance of interstate systems. But more uh, hundreds of accidents happen in these interstate roads each year throughout the nation. The poor condition of the roads are one of the main causes of these accidents. In 2001, the Highway Department of Arkansas, they uh, uh, reconstructed three major parts of Interstate 40 and, and Interstate 30. After a few years of the construction, they found some of the roads are uh, experienced severe cracking. But most of the several cracking of the roads are happened in west of the Conway. While on the roads of Interstate 40, of east of the Little Rock and the Interstate 30 in the near Arcadia, they are performing as designed. The highway department wants to know what is the main causes behind this, which is my research focus. To this end, we have collected pavement samples, cylindrical shaped pavement uh, samples from the good and the poor performing uh, pavements for testing their laboratory properties. We have also collected the historical data, the weather, traffic, construction, and design data to compare them with the laboratory results. We figured out that the excessive loads on pavements and the poor material properties are the main key factors for these pavement failures. We have, we have taken 25 parameters of pavement particles and we figured out that nine of them have significant impact on the pavement failures. We have also developed a model to estimate the future pavement failures, and uh, when we have pavement, uh, when we have the model, we can we can predict what would be the future pavement failures. This model could be used as a good pavement management tool uh, for the future projects of interstate projects. This project could be helpful to save money of the future projects. Thank you. The current world population is estimated to be about 7.1 billion, billion with a B. That's a lot of people. And agriculture is constantly pressured to keep up with this ever-growing population so that they can provide food for everyone. Well, we all know that agriculture and crops need fertilizer, they need nutrients. Well, you apply these nutrients to make crop yields um, increase, but Sometimes the plants don't always take up 100% of the nutrients, and those nutrients run off of the fields and are oftentimes lost 
to downstream drainage systems. Well, this contributes to what we call nutrient loading. And what happens is all these uh, nutrients get into these systems and eventually, especially in this part of the U.S., end up in the Mississippi and then exit out into the Gulf. And what happens when this happens is that these zones of hypoxia occur that um, are areas in the Gulf of low to no oxygen content. And this can kill a lot of the uh, fish life and aquatic life that happens there. And so what I'm looking at is a uh, tailwater recovery system. And this is a water recycling system that farmers are currently employing. And the basis of how it works, you have a reservoir or a collecting basin that collects rainwater and some groundwater that you can pump. And you basically, the farmers use that water to irrigate their fields. And when that water runs out of the fields, whether it be at the end of the season or mid-season, they catch it in these tailwater recovery ditches. They're just ditches that are dammed at one end and they can use pumps to pump that water back into the reservoir. And what I'm looking at is the water quality within that reservoir. Uh, how it changes, how the water chemistry changes throughout the year, um, and especially throughout the growing season, to determine if uh, it's effective at reducing downstream nutrient loading, and whether or not the water within the system is degrading like the water would be if it would leave the system. And hopefully, uh, from our results, this will encourage further use of tailwater recovery systems in more farms throughout the U.S. Thank you. Our next presenter is Wajit Barji from Engineering, Sustainable Use of Scrap Tire in Pavement. sustainable use of scrap tire construction on pavement. Every year, 300 million of scrap tires are being generated in the U.S. and improper disposals of these tires has become a serious threat to the national economy, public health, and environmental safety. These tires are depleting a valuable space for solid waste disposals. They are providing excellent breeding conditions to the disease carrying mosquitoes, rodents, and some of the harmful effects. And sometimes it causes environmental disaster like air water pollution, air pollution, etc. In order to find a proper solution, several research studies have been carried out in some of the states, but in Arkansas, no research studies have been carried out until now. My research objective is to use those scrap tires in pavement construction as ground tire work, for its use from Scrap tire. And ground tire rubber has very high potentials to produce asphalt rubber. So let me explain what is asphalt rubber. Asphalt rubber is the blend of asphalt cement, ground tire rubber, and some additives if needed. Due to its good resilience, absorbance, and structural bonding properties, it is reported to provide longer lasting rubber surface, reduce maintenance costs, reduce crackings, and short breaking distance and reduce noise level in the pavement. More importantly, it can help to conserve virgin materials like asphalt binder or new aggregate. For my research, I've collected asphalt binder samples and ground tire rubber, and I've prepared two different kinds of asphalt rubber, mixing with different kind of asphalt ground tire rubber with asphalt binder. And I have tested those samples in dynamic shearometer, rotational discometer, and penetration test device. And I have determined the performance properties and compared with the typical binder. And I found that stiffness of asphalt rubber increased with addition of ground tie rubber. And it is also seen that for 20% addition of ground tie rubber, stiffness of asphalt rubber increased up to 10 times of the typical asphalt binder. So this increased value of stiffness will also predict that this will be more resistant in the pavement riding or the major pavement damages. So this is how scrap tire can be used as pavement construction materials in a sustainable manner. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Next we have Lance 
Renew from Environmental Sciences. His presentation is Blood Parasites in Damselfish and Blennies of the Eastern Caribbean. Thank you all for coming. Um, so my work involves blood parasites of damselfish, uh, specifically members in the Caribbean Sea, so we're relatively close there. But worldwide, roughly 500 million people rely on coral reefs for some form of sustenance, either a primary source or they use it occasionally. But there's also recreation that people use it for. Well, along with that sustenance requirement, you're going to be dealing with a lot of overfishing. So people are fishing these areas that they they really need the sustenance, but they're depleting their sources. With that depletion, you lose a lot of the top level predators, a lot of the bigger fish. These are easier ones to catch. Well, if you look at a coral reef, what do you see? You see coral, you see fish, you see all the big pretty stuff. But on that coral reef, roughly 80% of the diversity is actually in the parasites. So these are the parasites that are feeding on the coral, feeding on the fish, feeding on the lobsters, the macro birds. So in this system, parasites provide the key link in the food web. They, they're a food source, but they're also a pressure on these host organisms. And they also facilitate cleaner interactions. So they're facilitating fish-to-fish -fish interactions. <coughs> and in this system, we found that the damselfish, which are a small herbivorous fish, they are infested with these blood parasites. With the blood parasites, they act as like a malaria to the fish, so they're detrimental. They decrease the amount of fitness of the fish. And my work is boils down to this is the first time in the entire world that we found damsel fish that had this blood parasite. Um, but this this thing, you might think, well, why is this such a big deal? These are small fish. There's a lot of them. All these large predators that were once there feeding on these individuals, they're no longer there. So these are becoming a big influence on how the reefs are formed and how they're occurring. So thank you very much. Senators John McClellan and Governor Orville Foss. 
The second would involve the rivalry that would particularly uh, dominate the 1980s between Governors Bill Clinton and Frank White and was credited with making a tough and Clinton president. And finally, marked by the ninth so-called 1990 Republican, quote, primary from hell between businessman Sheffield Nelson and former congressman and sheriff Tommy Robinson, both ex-Democrats, that became ground zero for Washington insiders as well as those wanting to take down a Democratic governor's presidential ambitions. In the end, these cross currents would set back this shift for a time, but it made it no less inevitable. Given Arkansas's past, my paper is going to seek to uh, establish that this move to New South Republicanism was not possible by any other means other than what the paper will discuss. Thank you very much. Our final presenter and a reminder to stay in the room, uh, those of you who are here, so that you're able to vote. So, John Arton from Environmental Sciences, does the patchy abundance, abundance of a fish parasite reflect its community relationships? Good morning. This little fish parasite over on the right is just like any other creature. It needs to have someplace safe to live, it needs to have food to eat, and it needs to avoid becoming somebody else's lunch. But this little guy lives on coral reefs, and coral reefs, like tropical rainforests, are very special places. They're the most biodiverse ecosystems They're the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. And this diversity means that there are lots of relationships that this parasite has to other creatures on the reef. I'm going to be basically counting in order to try and understand the interplay of some of these relationships. I'll put out lines of parasite traps and just count the number of parasites I find and compare what's going on with the various relationships that this parasite engages in with those counts. So for example, um, in prior work, I've looked at the fact that this parasite prefers living on dead coral and avoids live coral. In fact, live coral can eat this fish parasite. So I would expect that traps near dead coral will have more parasites in it. Traps near live coral will have fewer. I've also pumped the stomachs of little fish that I suspect probably eat this parasite and have in fact found naphids in their stomachs. So I would expect that reefs that have lots of these fish that eat the parasite will probably have relatively fewer parasites. Uh, we also know in coral reefs that there are some fish like this cleaning goby that set up cleaning stations, little spots that other fish come to to get these parasites eaten off of their bodies. So I would expect that these tra when traps are placed near a cleaning station, you'll have relatively fewer parasites in it than if the, tra if the trap is placed very far away from a cleaning station. And finally, I would also expect that they've got to eat, right? And since they feed on fish, and fish often like to rest in comfortable little, uh, under comfortable little overhangs in the reef, that traps placed near these fish hangouts are going to have relatively more naphids in it. So why, why do I want to do all of this? It would be really nice if we can use something simple like counts of fish parasites to be able to better understand the balance of these relationships and therefore get a better sense of the relative health of our coral reefs. Thank you very much. <laughs>